Welcome back to Warlord Radio podcast. This is Kara Coleman and this is Krishna Peri. <laughs> Clearly, that's that's what's going on here. <laughs> yeah, and today we have Shashank from Against Evil and uh, uh, Against Evil. Just just a quick uh, background here. Against Evil is a band from Vizag, India, and uh, same hometown as mine. And these guys have over over the past few years they have exponentially grown and uh, you know toured all over Europe and played with. some amazing bands and uh, they have released uh, their second full length album just a while back and now they're working on their third album and uh, uh, hi shashank how 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 have you been how's it going man hey, it's man. good to see you again thank you so much man i'm doing good how are you guys we're doing well um last time see shashank was awesome enough to come back on the show because the last time we tried to do an interview with him yeah. we just failed completely <laughs> it went it went just horribly so uh, we we appreciate you coming back we're much better equipped this time around what are we calling this episode the shashank redemption yes that's <laughs> that, that's how it is <laughs> that was clever to me <laughs> yeah well yeah. all right <laughs> anyway so uh, how is how is the musical landscape going on for you right now what what what, are, what is what is happening things are going good we're working uh, on our third album uh, mm-hmm. or the second full length album Okay. Uh, it began as an EP, which was supposed to release uh, in March this year, but the world went to shit, as we all know. Yes. So the lockdown gave us a lot of time to uh, write a couple more songs, and we're planning on releasing a full-length album early next year. So we're putting the finishing touches to it. Interesting. So uh, yeah. uh, the same person that uh, in Domination Studios uh, is that where you're going this time, or are you choosing somebody else? Yeah, it, it's the same team. Uh, the production handled by us as always, and uh, the artwork uh, as always done by the Croatian artist All Things Rotten, and uh, mixed and mastered by Simon at uh, Domination Studios, Italy. It's the same team. It has worked for us, and uh, we have a really good connection with each other. So mm-hmm. why fix it if it ain't broke, right? Yeah, of course. And have you guys been working with the same team since the first album, or is this yeah, some, yeah. This first album? Around? Yeah. Very cool. So they know how like your entire vibe is kind of supposed to go in the first place. I bet that makes it a lot easier now. Exactly. Yeah. See, that's precisely the reason why I work really closely with Shashank. And uh, also, just another uh, context here is that he also uh, uh, is an audio engineer himself. So he has uh, mixed all of my albums, including Lament's new uh, EP, which is going to be coming out very soon. So uh, the reason why I bring this up is because. you know once you <clears throat> kind of form a relationship with a with a engineer they automatically know what kind of sound you're going yeah. for and uh, you know they 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 know uh, what style of music you gravitate towards you know and what so, and what mistakes to fix well yeah of course that is that is quite <laughs> obvious let's not talk about those things and you know he has <laughs> okay there is this there, there is this there is one story i like to bring up because uh, uh, before the release of my first ep cyclotron uh i was still kind of putting my demos together you know so like i i had a uh, superior drummer like all these like virtual drummers uh, dr- uh, drum vsts and everything so i was trying to put those things together and uh, probably in 2017 something i sent him uh, one of my demos and then he was like this sounds like absolute garbage <laughs> 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 and then and then for for a few days i was just you know holding myself in the shower just like crying like this <laughs> and then <laughs> but 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 actually you know what in in his defense he he actually gave me some good tips as to how to make it sound much more better and then eventually we we did So well, I mean, I, I, mean I, I probably I probably meant it in a good way. I mean, since Krishna is a friend, I just gave it to him straight. If it was someone else, I didn't know, I would have probably wouldn't have said that. Oh, I say <laughs> the most horrible shit about my close friends. I yeah, uh, <laughs> I saved my silence for my enemies. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, exactly, that makes sense. Yeah, that's Krishna, a, that's a good line. I'll probably use it in a song someday. What's that? <laughs> That's a good line. I'll probably use it in the song someday. I, oh, I use yeah. my silence for my. See, yeah, the, and then he was telling me that uh, uh, stand up and fight was that the one that you were inspired after watching Spartacus or something, or was it the new album? Oh no, it's it's one of the new songs uh, on the upcoming album. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Basically, um, uh, you know, we were just talking about uh, this thing about drawing inspiration from different sources. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
of course you can go and write a bunch of songs uh, and you know maybe release like 15 to 20 songs that's cool but at the same time like each each song has to say something you know and if you look at against evil's catalog so far like they all have this theme where they sing about like you know war or you know just a falling down but still you know picking yourself back up those kind of things so just internal battle and and struggle and things like that yeah yeah it's a good theme yeah. uh, also also I mean, your shit's in my workout, motorcycles. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> so your stuff's in my workout mix. It gets me hyped up. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. Is there, is there going to be a theme for the third album this time? There is no theme as such. Probably uh, for the artwork, yes, which connects to one song on the album. Yeah. Uh, we, re- we, re- we really don't like doing uh, these things called concept albums where uh, the entire album is based off a story or something. We're not that good at writing a huge story or basing all the songs. It, it, we, it would be like limiting ourselves and uh, uh, we never attempted. Maybe someday, but uh, this album is not that. Yeah. Each song has its own theme, has its own uh, story or something. And uh, like I said, uh, the title track is connected to the artwork. And if, once you see the artwork, you'll probably understand yeah and also everybody is doing concept albums <coughs> me you are yeah he's absolutely <laughs> doing a concept album i'm helping him with it I mean, yeah now in his defense he's he's really good at uh, i mean uh, uh, he's really good at you know this imagining stuff i mean he's got he he of course his uh, both his albums don't have lyrics he's uh, uh, they're instrumental but still uh, it, that requires a lot of imagination i mean how would you name an instrumental song yes i wouldn't yeah. know yeah but still Every song of Krishna's that I listen to, and you, if you check out the name, you'll be like, yeah, that's actually, you know, it rings a bell. So yeah. it's, a, it's a good, it's a solid concept. You know what yeah, I it's mean? A good yeah, it's, a, yeah, yeah. it's readable. And and yes. that well, th- thank you for saying that. And uh, the thing is, uh, you're know, garbage, is, Krishna. You're oh, garbage. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I tell that myself. <laughs> I tell that to myself all day. Okay. So this is not new information. Anyway, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is. Uh, yes, there is there is a thing for naming instrumental songs. You know, it's like how do uh, uh, how do you name a bunch of you know squiggly guitar lines something? So that's the that's one of the main challenges. Yeah. So the way that I would do it is most likely uh, just uh, you know if you if you listen to any kind of movie soundtrack or you know um, especially old school guys like Joe Satriani, Steve Vai, all these people. So I, I tried kind of noticing what they were doing with their songs. And then uh, kind of internalize the uh, melody and think, okay, this is making me feel as if I should name the song as Alien Sex Robot or something, you know, like it, it doesn't, doesn't have to mean anything. Instrument, that's the beauty about instrumentals is that you can just name them anything like dog shit palooza or, you know. We, I think we, all, we almost do the same thing. We, uh, we write the instrumental music first and then we listen to it. And then 90, 99% of the time, the instrumental gives us an idea about what the song is supposed to be based off of. See, I actually do it the other way around. I tend to write lyrics first and then we put music to the lyrics. But I mean, like, I mean, it, there's no right way to do it or wrong way to yeah, do it. It's just exactly. it's interesting yeah. to see how other people mm-hmm. engineer their own music. But which, which is the most difficult way though? Like, is it writing instrumentally first and then writing lyrics or writing lyrics first and then coming up with a melody? Which, because I'm asking because my third album, I'm still like, I, I have plans to kind of, you know, sing for the, this time. So yeah. I'm trying to get a context. So what is your opinion about that? Uh, for me, it's definitely uh, the hardest thing would be writing lyrics first and then music later, because then you have to uh, you know, look for ways to fit in those lyrics. Yeah. For yeah. me, it's very easy uh, to write the music first and then, you know, uh, write some gibberish uh, lyrics. And then, you know, once you have a good vocal melody, you can sit and write lyrics. For me, that's the easiest thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense because at that point, I mean, you, you're free to kind of fit in whatever words as long as the syllables fit within the musical phrases. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I guess I just like pain. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we actually wrote a song uh, yesterday. Yeah, we wrote yeah it was yesterday. yesterday. Yeah, so so we, we wrote the song. Uh, we kind of finished it. So it's like this uh, 80s uh, Aussie rock ballad type situation. And then he came up with these like darkest lyrics, man. And I was reading them and I was like, do you need a hug? Or, you know, are you okay? I am in a bad place right now. <laughs> <laughs> I choose to express that through my art. So the darkness <laughs> is a metaphor for darkness. <laughs> yeah, essentially. The floor is made of floor. <laughs> Okay, so what 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 are the other guys in Against Table doing right now? Like, are they uh, also 
like uh, fine tuning the the song parts or like what is uh, what's happening uh, the music the music is written uh, and uh, i think five out of uh, eight or nine songs are already uh, recorded and already mixed and mastered as i said they were supposed to be out uh, in march last year uh, as an ep yeah but then we are adding three to four new songs so mm-hmm. we are waiting uh, for another couple of weeks so we can uh, travel to mumbai to record the drums mm-hmm. and then uh, we can record everything at our home studio here and uh, how difficult has it been just to move around like as a band during covid and everything like that like is it just has it been its own challenge or like cuz i have no idea like how far mumbai is from wisag like how, how long are we talking here how far oh it's far it's probably like uh, it's a 3 hour plane ride okay so 3 yeah. hours on a plane with what yeah. and there's five guys in the band <laughs> Uh no we don't all travel it's probably uh, me and me and the drummer oh, okay and, yeah this time it's it's only the drummer uh, going so which, well, it's not too bad but yeah, yeah. Uh, which 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 studio are you uh, choosing this time uh, uh this place called Joshua Music uh, it's mm-hmm. a pretty good studio uh, we recorded uh, uh, the drums for uh, the first five uh, songs there back in uh, february so it's a pretty good studio obviously we have to go back there to yeah. uh, retain the same sound because it's got to be on the same album right yeah yeah so, so are you going back like, there. are you going to scrap all the like the, the previous five tr- uh, songs no no or? no so that's what he's saying uh, is no. you, okay. we're rec- you know, be- going back to record with the same studio right. and the same okay. team so that they don't have to do that yeah yeah <laughs> exactly. make, exactly. make make makes sense it's, it's yeah. never it's never going to be the same but it's going to be like a continuation of those songs I mean, as long it, as you can make, make it fit, you like, know what I mean? Because like, if yeah. you start in one studio, and I've done this before, if you start in one studio and then end this to, like the album in another studio with a different engineer, you will get a completely different. It'll sound disconnected. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So exactly, and and more so if you're playing live drums, real drums. If you're recording real drums, once you set up a kit and once you mic it and once you dismantle everything, and you you can't set it back up. the way no. you just recorded yeah. it's it's impossible there's no preset on the planet that'll help you mic exactly. drums like that yeah it's, unless it's <laughs> a vst you know yeah. <laughs> vsts exactly. are taking over the world which i mean again that's that's a whole other conversation we we yeah. you know shashank and i we keep shooting back and forth regarding you know the current industry t- trends in production especially like you know we have been talking about the the uh, snare sound especially in the in the modern metal context uh, i i hope you know what i'm talking about the uh, the gent bands basically you know like the, the, the way yeah. that they do it and uh, what is uh, uh, tell me tell me your main complaint about uh, the modern metal sound you know you, you had a very specific thing about it <laughs> Uh, it all sounds the same for me uh, yeah. i i don't remember uh, our conversation all that well but yeah, yeah. Uh, i'm pretty sure we had this conversation but yeah it it all sounds pretty much the same and i'm guilty of doing that too because it sounds pretty good modern metal to me sounds really good yeah well i mean it's super clean it's super sharp you know what i mean like yeah. it's it's and that's to me the kind of the problem is it's it's too perfect mm-hmm. you know what exactly. i mean like it it's sounds perfect. it doesn't sound organic That's why I like yeah that's why I enjoy live drums cuz like say somebody like the drummer for Lament Configuration like the velocity that Joe puts behind those sticks and things like that adds a whole lot to his sound mm-hmm. if he just if every and I even I think Joe even uses triggers now but if he used triggers and like you know fake tones on everything mm-hmm. like even if he played it and then you know you go back and and put the VST over it to beef yeah. out the sound or whatever it's yeah. still going to sound more robotic and like factory like than it would if it's just Joe playing his ass off. Yeah. Yeah and and that and uh, I think most people uh, are obsessed with uh, how tight their music sounds these days. Yeah. So they're probably like uh, it's surgery all over their tracks you know they're cutting in uh, add you know cutting and pasting and bringing things closer and making it as perfect as possible which kind of loses the the live feel. Yeah. You know? Because why well, like it when there's like a just a small deviation in the note for yeah. a phrase or a like string, I like you know? yeah I like to hear uh, picks on strings and things like exactly. that like yeah mm-hmm. I, I I like that kind yeah. of thing and old school like you know you you hear certain feedback and all those things feed this is one thing that I hope 
uh, DI, like, you know, once, once you record a DI track and you reamp, which I'm cool with, that is fine because at this point you have so many amp choices, like literally yeah. so many of them. I'm, I'm fine with that. But my only complaint is if I can somehow get a feedback through DI, it would change the game for me completely because I like a little bit of, a, you know, because I'm a, such a huge fan of Joe Satriani, like uh, he does that, like all these swells, like Meow, those yeah. kind of things, you know, so... Uh, if I can somehow replicate that in, I think in yeah, I think it's I think it's not possible to get a feedback uh, while recording a DI because uh, yeah. we have a song on uh, the new album which also has kind of like a, a long uh, uh, like guitar in in front of an uh, in front of a speaker yeah. kind of feedback. Mm-hmm. So we tried doing it with the DI, but it didn't work. So we mic'd up a real amp, and only for that part we we used a you know my amp. Yeah, that, that kind of makes sense because it's physics, right? So feedback is only caused when you yeah. are in front of a physical uh, thing. Yes. This, this is not yes. this is not anything. It's yeah, it's the, the I, vibration yeah. of your own sound yeah. reacting I mean, to your you, strings. You can still you can still get the feedback if you if you like move closer to your monitors or something, but that feedback won't get recorded. Obviously. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that that is that is one of my only uh, things. If somehow future technology is able to do this, then then cool. Um, Why don't you guys make it and make us all rich? I'll sleep in your pool house, man. <laughs> Come up with the perfect like feedback simulator. Yeah, right? yeah, just we'll have so many hookers in the background and like so know. many hookers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Why in not? fact, I'm not showing up unless there's at least like 30 hookers. <laughs> well, I, I'm. I, I don't. That that's gonna be that's gonna be a shit show. Then you know, like, well, but, but, I'm but, here for it. <laughs> but um, like. So when you're not doing music, which is obviously like your job, that's like your career, like sound engineer, like doing all this, like, what do you do? Because like, I can't imagine you have a whole lot of free time. <laughs> uh, I probably, I, I play a lot of video, ga- video games, you know, uh, oh, yeah? I have a PlayStation 4 and I've been playing video games since I was a little kid. So being a PlayStation what are you playing guy, right now? I just finished The Last of Us Part 2. Oh man, that's a depressing ass game. <laughs> <laughs> it is, right? But yeah, lots of people give like these negative reviews about that game. So, what do you what do you think? What is your opinion? Uh, I think the most part of the negative reviews have to do with the story, the way they took the story. Uh-huh. And I don't want to spoil anything for you guys or the viewers or something, but uh, I kind of liked it. I mean, it as well, you know, a lot of reviews pointed out that it takes balls to kind of take a hugely popular game in that direction so yeah it was great i mean they, uh, you can't obviously compare it to the first part which was a masterpiece in my opinion yeah that's one of those yeah. work of art games you know what i mean yes. like this is a yeah. true work of art yes are you are you, uh, still... do, you do you have any plans for uh, uh, playing cyberpunk at some point. Ah, of course, man. Plans. Of That's course, what's uh, been, yeah, that has taken over my life. I now dream cyberpunk. I watch cyberpunk videos when I'm awake. Yeah. yeah. And then I play you cyberpunk. Know, I, was, I was this close to ordering, pre-ordering cyberpunk on PS4, but you know, this. I had this feeling. Uh, I was looking at this YouTube videos, uh, the gameplay videos, and I was like, you guys serious? Uh, I, I don't think this game is going to run on PlayStation 4. You know, I had this feeling like way before they even launched the game and it turned out to be true. And I'm yeah. actually happy I didn't pre-order the game because it's a shit show on the current gen console. Well, I mean, I'm even, I'm playing it on PC and I have to constantly clean out the save files because they'll crash the game. Yes, yeah. I'm running yeah, the right. entire game on low and we have a pretty good video card in that PC. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's just, this thing is, what it is, is it's new technology that they're like cramming yeah. into old technology. I, was just, I, think it, I think it was not finished. I, think, I don't think uh, it was finished either. It, it yeah. wasn't finished. It, it is not at all ready for launch. I think they need a probably need a year or something to make it uh, as good as it was expected to be. But I think they had a lot of pressure because it was delayed, I think, what, eight years or nine years? I don't know. It was nine years, but I've been waiting for this game to come out for like 20 years because I used to play the old tabletop game. Like oh, Cyberpunk yeah. and Johnny Silverhand and all these guys like have been in my life since I was in high school. And so uh, I will say this, the game itself is great. Like it's, it's a lot of fun. It's super buggy and there's all kinds of weird shit happening. Like cell phones just flying out of nowhere and hitting you in the face and like all kinds of weird crap. But um, like they do things in that game that are like really kind of cutting edge and that I've never really seen in video games, especially as far as like storytelling goes and things like that. And then they really like, 
stay true to that role playing game aspect of it. So, I mean, it's wild. I will say this the enemies in that game are so fucking hard to kill. Yeah. Like, if I I've shoot you in the videos head, of enemies like uh, whooshing through the screen like this, you know? Oh, yeah, no. Well, I mean, some of the enemies are supposed to whoosh through the screen like that. There's some teleportation power you can get that is very difficult to fucking deal with. Interesting. I didn't know that. But yeah, yeah, like if I, but I'll do like five headshots on a guy and he'll just stand there and I'm like, no, I just shot you in the face <laughs> with a shotgun. Like, fall down. <laughs> yeah, it's probably a, it's probably a bug. <laughs> I'm hoping. Yeah. It reminds me of Wolfenstein. Actually, like, uh, have you guys played that game? Yeah, 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 yeah I the, did. Yeah. The new Colossus, not the, not the previous ones. So yeah. especially that, like, I, I don't know what got into me. I, I actually maxed it out to like the most hardest difficulty. And then I was like, ah, oh, this can't be, this can't be anything. I, I'll just go, I'm just going to kill Nazis with the highest it's difficulty. Super, it's super <laughs> hard on the highest difficulty. No? And yeah. It was so difficult to even like go through at least, you know, first few levels because yeah. Uh, and I actually kind of like it whenever, whenever there's a good challenge in the video game, I kind of enjoy doing it, uh, play, playing it. So and I've seen you know, me, me and the me and the band got together one day at uh, Siri, our uh, singer's house, and we we're having uh, drinks. And Siri was playing Wolfenstein. Uh, I think it was the New Order. I think uh, the first yeah. part of yeah. the re- reboot. And uh, there was a section that he was trying to clear, and he couldn't. So he handed out uh, the controller to me, and uh, I'm the I'm the more experienced gamer in the group. So I tried to clear it, and I died. And the others, you know, we passed it on the controller, and we couldn't do it. And uh, we couldn't do it. It was really frustrating. I mean, yeah, we were having drinks, which was an excuse. But <laughs> yeah, uh, of course. But yeah. then we, but then we checked the difficulty, and it was on the max. That's we yeah. That. Well, I mean, both Wolfenstein and Doom, because um, like, and this goes like old school back to the first Wolfenstein and Doom games. Like, yeah. there is a distinct curve in difficulty between like the highest. And then the like the max hard mm-hmm. level, yeah. you know what I mean? The hard, like it's like the hard is very difficult. The exactly. max hard is fucking impossible. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Speaking of most difficult games, uh, this is one thing that I've uh, I've been like telling every single person that I know. It's Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice. So yeah. that Hellblade. is that is uh, basically the whole game is set in uh, the Norse uh, context, you know. So. Uh, it's all about uh, this uh, this uh, this woman. Her name is Senua. She uh, like she's basically carrying her husband's like severed head on her waist. Yeah, and she's like going to meet Hela, like you know the uh, the goddess uh, death. Yeah. So basically, I people told me that this game is like really difficult. I just didn't buy into it. But once I actually got into it, I even the even the normal difficulty is really difficult you know yeah. because uh, eventually what happens is like uh, once you reach the boss stages once you kind of reach the last stages of the game you're like you know what i just want to fling this pc out of my window you know that's how that's how difficult that is so yeah wolfenstein cyberpunk uh, uh hellblade these are these will the be the demon like, souls yeah. games i yes. didn't yes. i didn't oh. enjoy the demon souls games yeah. because i don't like yeah. doing the same thing over and over and over again and i just i kept dying yeah it was and, really yeah, that's, hard that's a super that's a super hard game to beat to you know yeah, well, that's one of those ones. Like, that's not even a game. That's for bragging rights. Like, you beat Demon <laughs> Souls, you get to tell everybody what yeah. a fucking hardcore gamer you are. Exactly. Like, oh. I played. I played Sekiro. Uh, Shadows yeah. died twice at a friend's place, and it it wasn't for me. I yeah. mean, probably hardcore gamers must be laughing their asses looking at this and you know me saying this, but you know it isn't for me. I I'd like to. I mean, I of course like a challenge in a game. I really like a good challenge. But you know that game wasn't for me because it's it's all about the timing. It's about the you know the parrying and the timing and striking and one wrong move and you know you have to do the same thing over and over again. Like hours of gameplay is is yeah. gone one at one wrong move. It's not for me. It's super frustrating. Yeah, that shit. You guys should, you guys should check out. You guys should check out uh, Sekiro uh, reactions or whatever. I mean frustration mm-hmm. videos on YouTube. It's super funny. The frustration videos. Yeah, okay. people losing, yeah. people losing their break, shit. Yeah, they legitimately break their keyboards and like you know throw yeah, their yeah. PCs and everything. And yeah. uh, what I think is, what I think is, Demon Souls when it came out, like that was one of a kind. You know, like no game has existed like that yeah. before that. So Demon Souls has that uh, uh, you know like block 
kind of thingy like uh, sword mechanics and all that which were copied later on in like assassin's creed and like whatever games that we play like those kind of yeah. it can be uh, something like um, what is that uh, mountain blade like all these games yeah. like they, they, they well, I mean even the, the batman arkham games mm-hmm. work off that yeah. kind of combat yeah. engine yeah, yeah. exactly and uh, demon souls is coming back on ps5 so that's remastered yeah, version so yeah it does it's a, it's actually a re, re uh, how do i say this it's a not not just a remaster i think it's uh, it's a remake it's a remake kind of like what they did with the final fantasy game where it's like we're taking this game but then we're going to make a whole new game based off this yeah, game yeah they made a whole yeah. new game based off yeah. yeah that would be fine but Anyway, we'll take a quick break. And, uh, He's we'll like, I'm going to go cry and think about Demon's <laughs> yeah, Souls. Yeah, right, exactly. I'm going to cry about the fact that I don't have a PS5 yet. But we're going to take a quick break. Uh, and uh, we're going to play one of your uh, songs. Uh, so which one would it be? Uh, I'll Hail the King, the title track of our latest album. All right. So here is All Hail the King from the album All Hail the King by Against Evil. Check it out. Let me 
Okay, welcome back. Uh, that was All Hail the King from the album All Hail the King by Against Evil. And uh, what's up? <laughs> what's up? No, I, I, we actually, we brought, we touched on this a little bit last time we had you on. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Against Evil. He showed me you guys and now I bump all of your shit constantly. Um, you. And so I was wondering, like, and we talked about this a little bit last time. There's a lot of different influences in it. Like, you guys still have a semi-modern metal sound, but I hear like a lot of like classic inspirations, like classic metal, like Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, that kind of thing. A lot yeah. of thrash. Uh, there's a lot of creator in there, in my opinion. Uh, it's like, those are what I'm guessing. Who, who like actually informs the sound for you? Like when you picture yourself writing an Against Evil song, like what kind of headspace do you kind of take up? You know what I mean? Oh, okay, when I'm writing a song, uh, none because I, I don't listen to any other artist when I'm writing music for Against Evil. Otherwise, but, you will uh, find their it, stuff in your stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but uh, for the band and the sound, and you know, uh, starting off, uh, definitely, it's probably Megadeth. It's one of my favorite bands. Good, good answer. You know, that's that's number one. Uh, I mean, not more so for the sound, but uh, it, it, Megadeth has been inspiration for me to pick up the guitar and, you know, kind of do what I do best. Uh, for Dave Mustaine against, inspired even, me to kick children. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say those things. <laughs> but so, okay, like, so much, yeah, so Megadeth inspired you to pick up a guitar in the first place? Pick up the guitar and, you know, music, you know, do shit with the guitar, uh, just make music. But for Against Evil, it probably has to be Judas Priest, except Iron Maiden. Yeah. Okay, one yeah. quick question. Uh, top Megadeth album, in your opinion? It's, it's sitting right there behind you. Yeah, there you go. Rust in Peace. Rust in Peace is a yeah. classic. Yeah. What, what would your uh, top Megadeth be? Euthanasia. I'm kidding. No, <laughs> it's, right. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good album. It is. It's a killer yeah. album, well, yeah. Either yeah. Rust in Peace or uh, um, Peace Sells. Hmm. Yeah. That's a good choice. Yeah, uh, I've always liked that album. My, I like Megadeth. Yeah, I mean, I, I like most of their catalog, except for Risk and all that nonsense, like Super Collider and all that shit. But I... So yeah, Super I mean, Collider was bad, but Risk is kind of good. You know, if you just take out the Megadeth tag and just listen to it as a separate band, it's, it's, yeah, it's good music. You know? Probably. Probably like came that, out in the wrong time mm -hmm. because they were at their peak with that lineup, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. after after a couple of kick-ass albums, you know, you have Rust in Peace, you have Countdown, you have, uh, you know, uh, Euthanasia, and then you have, uh, what was the other album with uh, Trust? I forgot the name. Oh, Cryptic Writings? With, with Trust. Cryptic Writings yeah, is Cryptic an excellent writing. album. So they're all yeah. kick-ass albums. Yeah, yeah my, with, with, my with the I mean, has to... Rust in Peace lineup, and then they release Risk. So, of course, the fans lost their shit. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, my my favorite, I mean, this is again cliche, like, you know, uh, mine has to be Rust in Peace because that is the quintessential Megadeth, like, trash uh, album. Yeah. But at the same time, like, I, if, if I, because you guys already chose that, I would pick uh, Countdown for myself. Because Countdown first of all, yeah. it's, it's very... Uh, accessible to public like you know if 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 somebody that i know like you know uh, uh, they come up to me and they're like hey who's megadeth then if i show them countdown to extinction they'll be like okay so i kind of get the vibe probably yeah so yeah yeah it's, it's got a, it's got a nice speed metal sound to it mm -hmm. you know, countdown it's kind of like when they really solidified like what megadeth sounds like within like the span of those three albums yeah. so they kind of defined what thrash is you know what i mean like with you yeah. know of course with the help of like metallica and exodus and all the other bands from around that area mm -hmm. but i mean megadeth really did when i think thrash i don't think metallica i think megadeth yeah typically yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah and you're talking about judas priest what's your favorite judas priest album screaming for vengeance screaming yeah. for vengeance is a nice. great album yeah mine's mine's painkiller i love that album i love everything about that yeah. album dude <laughs> My, yeah me too yeah yeah Mine's, uh, I mean, I, I like the new one. I like the Firepower. I like the new yeah, one too. Yeah, yeah. The new one is it, it is. Yeah, it's kick ass. Yeah. Uh, uh, and you guys have actually covered uh, Firepower, right? In one of your live shows? Yeah, yeah live shows, yeah. yeah. We did. And, and uh, I think the new one kind of captures the essence of all the, all the uh, old school songs and kind of uh, puts that like little, uh, you know, nice a twist and everything and then like has these solid memorable riffs and i guess i guess uh wh what i'm trying to say is it's a solid album man it's like yeah. songwriting production everything they've got it on point yeah. 
and according to me it's like i i i think uh, even he agrees is that like a, a good song the definition of a good song has to have riffs you know so i guess it has to be memorable yeah, yeah it can't cuz yeah. i mean like i love ingve malmsteen right like i love ingve yeah. but i mean all it is is just look how fucking good i am at guitar there's not a whole <laughs> lot of like super memorable riffs like there's really good phrases and really good movements and really impressive playing mm-hmm. but i'm not getting like those fat recognizable riffs that get stuck in my head for days you know mm-hmm. what i mean yeah whereas judas priest is like primarily fat ass riffs that get stuck in my head for days yeah exactly yeah. and that is my major complaint when it comes to genres like jazz as well i mean don't get me wrong i do listen to like some modern jazz here i don't like, fucking like but, jazz at all of the hot take i don't fucking like jazz <laughs> play the goddamn <laughs> note you play the right <laughs> notes already <laughs> yeah but but there are there are a, there are there's like a very small margin of bands who actually do write memorable things like you know if you listen to gathri govan like aristocrats or someone like they, they do actually have like a nice hook and then <coughs> the way that they kind of you know jazz happens it, let's say the right way of playing jazz is more like okay you come up with a nice melody hook uh, like a verse whatever it is and then like trail off into this you know whole shreddy part and then come back to uh the uh, main riff for what I don't know when I listen to jazz I'm just like all right we came up with a riff now <laughs> the bass player is just going to shit all over the floor right. and the guitar player is going to play dissonant notes that don't make any fucking sense <laughs> This is, a, this is a metal podcast. We have this guy on a trumpet that's just going to fucking go off. Like, we're going we're gonna to shit on jazz all day. Yeah, I podcast. could definitely do that. And also, uh, we were shitting on ukulele players because we... <laughs> well, uh, the town that we're in right now, Denton, Texas, is known for its singer-songwriter scene, which... I can only hear you play wagon oh, okay. wheel on a fucking ukulele so many goddamn times, dude. Like every like I went to an open mic night not too long ago and literally heard three different people cover the same fucking song on three different shitty ukuleles and I was just like I can't do this anymore. I'm going to go outside and hang out and just I don't know, a free on until I die. I can't I can't be here anymore. When when is against evil ukulele uh, uh, album coming out? Yeah, when you know this. Your ukulele odyssey. <laughs> shoot me in the face when it does <laughs> absolutely when when pigs when pigs shall fly <laughs> amazing so um you said that your your newer album is coming out like kind of first of next year which is in two weeks but i mean uh are you shooting for like early spring or or like how are you what what's your target for that thing because i know uh, that things don't always work out probably summer don't you know? the summer nice yeah interesting that'll be a good because time we, we can't wait we can't wait to put it out because we've been sitting on these songs for more than a year especially yeah. we have uh, five or six songs that are already done mixed and mastered so we have the ready songs you know we have them ready to go so we've been sitting on them for months and months so if i delay them any longer i'll probably put them all on youtube myself and you know leak <laughs> it myself yeah. is, is there a pressure from uh, uh, the label by any chance absolutely not there is no pressure from the label okay. they're very supportive and it's actually one of their ideas to you know make it into full length album because you know apparently full length albums uh, are w- much more well received than eps in yeah. Yeah. they're right you know they're absolutely yeah. right Be- because see be- because uh, you have noticed this uh, thing where all the bands these days or all the artists they're just putting out eps all or the time or singles like yeah. sometimes not even eps just singles which is which is cool i, I yeah, in, a, in a way because they're kind of generating content it's more like uh, yeah, exactly. if you if you post something uh, today and then maybe post another single you know two months down the line then you have another spike of audience in you that, that yeah. that's totally acceptable but then it kind of uh, took away this essence of the album you know so if you if yeah. i have against evil's album right here so if if i yeah. opt the cd in the in the car i would want to listen thing. to the whole yeah. thing you know so like that exactly. is uh, exactly. something yeah. uh, it's just a preference really and uh, if you come out with like a 11 song album then that is i think much more palatable because you have a different Well, not to mention, I mean, you took time to arrange those songs and put them on the album in a way that makes the album a cohesive project. And you don't really get that with mm-hmm. EPs and singles, exactly. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. there are certain things about the first song on that album that can inform the last song of that album yeah, that I'll love, like that. you know what I mean? Yeah. There's a story. Yeah, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of also a negative thing about full-length albums because uh, uh, most people, and I'm not talking about... Uh, musicians i'm talking about uh, people who consume music people who buy music the the yeah. listeners yeah. they uh, and i've seen this for myself you know they 
actually look at a full length album and they say only eight songs or only seven songs i i would like it more if if there are 12 songs or 15 songs but as an artist or as a as a musician i would actually prefer quality over quantity i would yeah. have five songs that kick fucking ass over you know 10 tracks which are like okay or something yeah. like that so that's why i think eps uh, are uh, the thing right now as in uh, more for uh, underground bands because if if a band sits and writes five songs that you know kick uh, a lot of ass uh, and you know no fillers at all all killers you know i think ep i i actually support eps that was one of the reasons why we actually wanted to release an ep last year but mm-hmm. then uh, this lockdown gave us a lot of time so we had no excuse but to write new songs yeah. and we had a couple of other killer songs so why not make it an album and release it together yeah no i mean it's a solid plan and like you said like covid's got all of us going nowhere like yes. we're all we're all at home working right now i mean like we he we were working on his solo album right now and we've already got what four or five songs done on that yeah, one yeah yeah so like uh, uh that was kind of my follow up uh, uh thing that i want to talk about is that i ca- uh, came up with nine uh, ideas basically and then out of the nine we finished about five and uh uh basically the reason why i chose even nine is because that is like a good uh, number logistically so uh if you notice like even with even with uh, uh, your second album i'm sure you must have uh, noticed this thing where uh, you know the more songs you write obviously it's logistically much more difficult you know like you have to pay for extra mixing mastering like yeah. you have to do all those things yeah. so yeah. what is what is your opinion on that like uh, uh, if you have longer uh, you know more amount of songs how do you deal with the logistics of uh, uh, production it's it's definitely more expensive because uh, how studios and uh, engineers work these days is uh, you know probably on an hourly basis or per song basis mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. it's definitely expensive if you're writing more songs recording more songs take up a lot of uh, studio time and obviously you have to pay uh, the mixing engineers per song so it's yeah. definitely expensive but if you've got good music if you have nine songs that you know kick ass you know then go ahead and record all of them i mean yeah. there's no point in leaving out any song you know just because it's expensive or something but yeah, yeah. Makes uh, sense. i say i say don't put in songs just to add the number mm-hmm. uh, if you have five or six songs just put them just release them as it is you know there's no need to make it nine or just 10 it's not a magic number it's not going to do anything uh, special for the band so it'll sound rushed it'll sound like yes, you're just churning rushed. stuff out yeah yeah exactly yeah and the, and the the other important thing is um, of course to have a, a flavor going on between uh, different songs you know so i don't want to listen to the same riff repeated over like you know 11 songs <laughs> acdc yeah. acdc has <laughs> been playing the same song for 30 years but but uh, so so you know until now we have been speaking we have been speaking about like you know riffs and everything so now like if we talk about things from a producer's perspective or like a mix engineer's perspective uh how would you approach uh, mixing a song typically so if i if i just like send you a bunch of tracks 15 to 20 tracks so what is your ideal thought process after you tell him that he's garbage <laughs> what do you do yeah that's the first step that's step number one yeah <laughs> I think the first thing first step that I do is I'm actually a, a beginner in in the mixing world right now I'm not uh, really out there I'm just getting out there thanks to you know, people like Krishna for you know giving me a lot of opportunities you know to get my sound It sounds out great. I mean all of his all of the, I mean from a from a production standpoint alone all th- uh, or all of or both of his albums rather sound fucking great like they really do they sound professional and like quality so thank you should you. at least be proud of that <laughs> thank you yeah so yeah uh, what i probably do is i actually take a lot of time to listen to the song first you know with yeah. so just just balance it a little bit uh, in a way that i like it and i li- like to listen to the song you know what's happening where you know which instrument is you know going crazy at what parts you know what the guitars doing what the vocals are doing or what the drums are doing and then i approach it individually you know i you know uh, take uh, chunks of the song probably i start with drums and then add bass to it and then the guitars whatever and i you know my approach is uh, i don't know I, i it's 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 not uh, in a per book or something yeah uh, so i i do things as i see fit you know kind of more by feeling like yeah, i feel like feeling. yeah Well, I mean, if you have an educated ear, that's good. You know what I mean? There's a lot of guys yeah, who yeah, are like, oh, no, I'm just yeah. doing it by feeling, and then they don't know what the fuck they're doing. Yeah. So, yeah, like, yeah. Lot, yeah. 
and i guess at this point all of us we have been listening just listening to music for so many years you know yeah so i guess uh, uh well, you know at this point we we kind of already have a sense of how the song should sound like so yeah. once you actually start mixing you're like okay so it's kind of uh, rings a bell to me uh, with some creative song or like some cannibal corpse or something you know so uh, you there get are little flavors that you can pick yeah. from different things and be like okay there's there's elements of all these things in here so i kind of have an idea of which way i want to go with it like for yeah, example insp- inspiration actually helps you know if you have yeah. uh, for example his first album reminds reminded me of the early uh, surfing with the alien joe satriani uh, kind of uh, you know music so i was listening to a lot of joe satriani uh, just to give me inspiration to how to mix his songs you know the kind uh-huh. of approaches that yeah. you know just uh, and just with lament uh, like i was you know telling krishna you know, i was listening to a lot of uh, the latest benediction album which uh, kicks ass yeah. Yeah. and also a lot of a lot of death and obituary just to because i don't listen to a lot of death metal you know uh, i i do like death metal but i don't listen to it a lot so just to mix lament and you know just to get an idea of how you know things should sound i was in, listening to a lot of you know the latest benediction album and things so it Ooh. gave me a good picture of how to start things off I agree. The new Benediction album is great. You literally can't. I can't imagine that you can work with Lament configuration on any level if you don't know anything about Death, because yeah. Death, death yeah. is like everybody yeah. in that band. Like you should hear them talk about Death. It's like <laughs> hearing like little kids trade Power Rangers on a playground. <laughs> they just they love Death yeah. so much. I love Death too, yeah, but not course. like you guys. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, uh, Sam and Joe, especially Joe yeah. is our drummer. Like he's just a fangirl when it comes to <laughs> yes when it comes to death but uh, i personally like the fact that uh, in a chakshulinar he was able to do this prog thing without even knowing that it's prog and, yeah. and then he would just jump between riffs like so easily i do i like how basically that guy was just so big an asshole that he created a genre of music <laughs> yeah <laughs> apparently apparently his parents took away, took away his guitar and he wrote all the riffs like on paper like through his mind or something and i'm like how how is that even possible <laughs> Yeah, and also the cover of Painkiller kicks ass, man. Oh yeah, yeah. the sound of uh, <laughs> that, that was man. that was supposed to be uh, like he uh, Chuck uh, su- was supposed to actually have like a side project. Uh, was it called Control Denied? I think yeah, yeah, yeah that was I think that's what it was called. And uh, I th- uh, certain songs on Sound of Perseverance album, like they were supposed to be on uh, his like different band. And uh, Painkiller was also supposed to be in one of those things, but. it just ended up in uh, a death catalog still yeah. sounds you know pretty fucking amazing so I, i think i think it came out as a bonus track on sound of severance uh, yeah. as a, i think it was a, it's the deluxe edition re- remixed something i don't know something <laughs> deluxe that actually goes back to again about like albums and eps and like full works of music is like there are songs that were technically secret bonus tracks and things like that that have like yeah. greatly influenced the mm-hmm. music that i write yeah I can't of course think of an example right now because I put myself on the fucking spot but like there are definitely things where it's like this isn't listed on the album this is a, like a lesser known B side but it's like amazing you know I'll, I'll I mean? give you an example uh Megadeth released uh, Kill the King which was yep. not yeah. there on any album it was just like a bonus yep. thing that they did yeah. for like a, a compilation release or something so the, again that makes sense because like if you're releasing an album or a vinyl or something you can just be like hey th- th- if you purchase this vinyl you get to hear this extra one track yeah. which, which is, is not what there we did, yeah. yeah something like that which 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 song did you quest for the diesel beast isn't on the album it was uh, oh. that was a singular that was a bonus track basically what was happening is our album was running late and so we released a single uh to kind of hype the album while we were still working on the fucking album and then uh when it when you bought when the album finally released whether you bought a dig or a digital copy or a cd or a vinyl or whatever you got a free download of quest for the diesel bees ah interesting and it i mean it worked out that's one of our like better known songs at this point uh here so i mean but i mean we did that out of necessity because we were running behind on our fucking album mm-hmm. uh, we are doing it right now too because you know now we have entered the european market we have a record label that's uh, based out of uh, switzerland yeah. so you know everybody in europe likes bonus tracks you know and uh, we have uh, this new label for us is doing vinyls uh you know releasing our albums in you know the vinyl format so the last know. album a previous album all hail the king uh, had uh, the judas priest cover between the hammer and the anvil Yeah, I love that fucking yeah. song. 
Yeah, so we covered that and they put it as a bonus track on the vinyl and uh, the CD had our entire EP, uh, the first album that we released, it was a five song EP. So the CD had the entire five song EP as bonus. So, so the Europeans love bonus tracks and we're doing a little bit of uh, bonus material on the new album too. That's awesome. Did, did you did you find it difficult to break into uh, the American market or was it much more easy to get into European uh, uh, circuit? How was that like? Uh, we didn't do anything. <laughs> uh, we just re- we we just released music, and uh, the kind of response and the kind of audience we were getting was a lot from the European side. Mm-hmm. I don't know, probably because heavy metal, uh, the kind of heavy metal that we are doing, you know, anthemic heavy metal, is a lot popular there uh, than in America. I mean, of course, America has its power metal and uh, you know uh, those uh, genres of music, but you know the kind of music that we uh, are doing and uh, you know kind of you know just uh, struck a chord with the audience uh, in europe so we started getting a lot of uh, orders uh, the, you know people started buying our cds you know and about 70 to 80 percent was from europe so we started targeting europe you know all our ads uh, all our promotions were based uh, on those particular countries yeah. so yeah that's how it we didn't do anything so we got an audience and we just responded by it's like you know yeah. sending a signal to the aliens and they responded back yeah. so, <laughs> I, I think uh, I think that's a uh, that's a good way to kind of figure out your market because I realize that here in like just the, just the US, right? So people are either listening to hip hop yeah. or uh, just uh, you know just any kind of any versions of modern hip hop, lo fi, and uh, if it's metal or if it's like any kind of thing related to you know guitars, it's mostly instrumental prog or uh, metalcore or death metal like these are like the top yeah. five genres especially here in uh, dfw like death metal is death uh, metal yeah. is prominent throughout yeah. the entire yeah we live in like this giant yeah. metroplex like you've been to dallas yeah like uh we live in this giant metroplex and like nine out of ten bands are like tech death mm-hmm. you know what i mean and there's nothing wrong with that but at the same time it's like when you watch a show with only tech death bands on the bill, like yeah. it tends to bleed together sometimes. Yeah. It's like, I get it. Like you guys can all play really, really fucking fast. Yeah. Well, like, uh, uh, tech death, not so much, I guess. I mean, I've only seen a few tech death bands here. Yeah. But, but death metal. Death metal just, in just, general, that is, yeah. yeah. Like, so if you, like, like you said, you know, if you go to a venue or something, you would, everything just kind of sounds the same at some point. But, but, uh, what I'm trying to say is if you maybe, I mean, I don't have a context on this, but if you go to a European market, like a European uh, show, I'm assuming uh, the situation there is much different, you know? So, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of mixed artists on the bill uh, in Europe. That's what I have seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, of course, there are festivals or shows that have uh, probably like ext- only extreme metal on the lineup. That happens a lot, but uh, also more, more of the festival shows. I mean, that's what Europe is all, all about. You know, yeah, all these festivals fest, have so. a lot of mixed uh, bills. You know, you have a death metal band, and then you have a power metal band, and then you have a thrash metal band, and then you have baby metal. <laughs> uh, you weird. have all all kinds. <laughs> of, yeah, you have all kinds of uh, you know bands playing. So I think that's a lot interesting rather than having the same kind of uh, genre mm-hmm. bands playing on the bill. You know, it's also kind of regional, I would imagine, because I mean, Europe is a pretty expansive continent with a you know a million different countries in it. And every one of those countries seems to have kind of their own twist on metal. Like, you know, the fin- you can tell the difference between like Finnish metal and Swedish metal. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, or even yeah. Italian metal and, you know, British metal. Yeah. Like there's a big difference in a lot of that stuff. And also, if you notice, like the major cities are less in number when compared to the U.S., Yes. So in US, if if I have to say, if I have to just off the top of my head, if I have to list a bunch of cities, I can just, you know, at least give you fifteen, you know. Yeah. Uh, but but Europe, it's I I'm it's not like that, right? So if you take if you take Germany, there are only maybe like what three or four major places, uh, right? So I mean, if you have to go to a show, for example, so you would have to travel like a long distance to get to a place. And that's why people being very passionate, they obviously, they, they take the time and trouble and effort and energy to travel across different uh, yeah. you know, countries just to see that one specific band. Did you, did you ever face that? Did you ever notice that uh, thing happening there? Uh, I, I didn't get you. I'm sorry. Oh, well, so I was saying that like, uh, because the, because the major cities are less in number. So if somebody has to uh, come see a show in Europe, 
they travel okay. across different countries so no, i, I think there was uh, one incident that happened with you uh, can you tell us about that uh i don't remember this but i think europe is a lot smaller compared to you know america or uh, india so it's a lot easier to go around probably uh, someone in germany uh, once you go to sweden rock fest it probably take them a couple of hours that's it Mm-hmm. and uh, if uh, someone wants to go to like switzerland for a festival or you know wants to go to you know hellfest in mm-hmm. france it would only probably take them only a couple of hours you know this this drive which was also the kind of easy easiest uh, thing for us to you know tour all over europe is is that it's you know it's approachable you know it's easy you can just drive wherever you want to i, I don't think that's possible in america and definitely not possible in india right because it's, it's difficult it's so i huge. mean especially we live like in Texas if you were to drive around the outer edge of Texas and hit all of the cities on the outer edge of Texas it would take you like 2 days yeah it's a huge landmass yeah. like <laughs> yeah i i yeah. drove from east coast to texas and it took me 22 hours 22 hours straight <laughs> through yeah. yeah and i had to stop in between somewhere so like while driving it was just me uh, you know i was just moving from east coast to uh, texas but while i was driving i was thinking If I was on a tour right now this would suck so much. Oh it does. Because... <laughs> American tours are brutal and there's a whole lot of road. There's a lot of nothing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like cornfields and yeah, shit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. But hopefully you would break into the American market as well and you know get to experience uh, certain things. Yeah, I really hope so someday. Yeah, we would love to you know play in America. We, I think we we do have a couple of uh, not couple actually uh, a good number of uh, fans in America. We we've, we've been getting a lot of uh, orders on our band camp uh, site so yeah let's see what happens with the latest album you know okay so that's uh, that's shashank from against evil for you guys thank and, you so uh, much for coming out thank yeah. you for doing this again so this is the yeah this is shashank you. redemption <laughs> and <laughs> it's, okay it's free, it's it's free promotion for my band how can i say no yeah, exactly hey man <laughs> <laughs> i'll freely promote your band all the time against evil is thank fucking you. awesome man and thank before you, we go so uh uh let's let's do one more song uh and this time what what what's it going to be let's do sentence to death okay and one spe- special thing about that track is that jeff lumis has done a guest solo on, oh, on this track yeah. yeah so yeah. you get to hear sentence to death by against evil and uh, thank you for tuning in uh with warlord radio podcast and what do we say at the end <laughs> fuck varg vikerns <laughs> i hope fucking piece of shit i hope everybody has a nice new year just kidding it's going to suck it's going to suck <laughs> but i hope against evil has a successful year at least yeah of course <laughs> all right yeah. we really appreciate it shashank thank you so much for doing this man thanks for having me man thank you man take care of course
you're listening to Warlord Radio Podcast, please hit like and subscribe at the bottom.